work at a large crafting store in California and have been there for a year and eight months now. A little background before I explain what's been going on is needed. Last year we hired a guy, we'll name him Hayden. Hayden was a little quiet on the first day but quickly became more talkative and over the next couple of weeks started to never stop talking. He would constantly say weird stuff. For instance, one day he was in charge of building furniture. Our store carries stuff like furniture and home decor as well. He was apparently having difficulty assembling the table he was working on and said something about cutting his wrists if he can't figure out how to put it together. Another time we were both working in the stock room and he kept talking about how much he looked like the Parkland shooter Nicholas Cruz. I'll admit he did in fact look like that kid, but it was creepy nonetheless. I remember one day I had gotten off of work and was waiting for my ride to pick me up when, out of nowhere, Hayden walked up behind me. He just stood there with an awkward smile on his face and I politely asked him what's up. He said something to the effect of, Oh, nothing much. Just enjoying my lunch break. I'm thinking about going inside Taco Bell, which was right across the parking lot from our work, and shanking somebody. He pretty much laughed and said he was joking after saying that. When my wife picked me up, we saw him walking toward the Taco Bell and just flashed us this creepy ear-to-ear -ear smile. And so the last straw for me was when he and I were assigned to work our spring freight and get it loaded up on a large U-boat. Our shift started at 7am and was over at noon. It was 11 and we still hadn't finished our task because Aiden just wouldn't stop goofing around. He would also work very slowly on purpose and would only take one item to the U-boat at once. Our boss came to where we were working and was upset that we weren't done yet. He told us we would both get written up if the job wasn't finished before we were off. I was mad at this point and Hayden knew it. He seemed to feel pretty bad for pretty much getting me in trouble and apologized. He then said something that really concerned me. He said in the most serious tone I had ever heard him speak in since meeting him, if I get fired I'll shoot this place up. He went on to say that he knew where all the emergency exits are and would first shoot all the cashiers and then move on to the other employees in the store. I'll admit I didn't immediately report what he said, but it did have me on edge and I kept thinking about what if. After some convincing from my wife, I finally did the right thing and informed my manager. They took a report from me and contacted the police. After two more days of working with Hayden, he was fired and subsequently arrested for his threats. The week after he got arrested, my boss held a meeting with the entire staff and told everyone what happened. After everyone left the meeting, he pulled me aside and revealed to me what the police and Hayden talked about during the interrogation. I don't completely remember what was said, but Hayden apparently admitted that he said what he said and kept asking if I had been the one who reported him. Fast forward to a few weeks ago, I was working at the same store, still am, and I was heading to the break room for my final break when I heard a voice from one of the aisles to the left. A man was standing next to the paint case and asked if I could get him some paint. While I was opening the case, he addressed me by name, which I immediately thought was weird because I wasn't wearing my name tag on this particular day. Out of curiosity, I asked him how he knew my name, and he said it was just a lucky guess, to which I thought was BS, mainly because his tone of voice seemed sarcastic. The entire time I was getting his paint, he was staring at me with a smirk on his face. He then began to ask me questions about my name, which is the same name of a popular TV show character. He asked what year I was born in, why my parents decided to give me that name, etc. At this point I started to walk away and as I had other things to do and the whole time I was walking away he was still trying to talk to me and I heard him yelling my name from three aisles down. I went and stood in the warehouse until I thought he was gone. Later that same day, one of my co-workers asked me if I knew the guy who was buying the paint, and I told her I didn't. She told me that he had approached her and asked her all kinds of questions about me, like if I'm a good worker and if she likes me as a co-worker. This is an ongoing issue, too, as he comes into the store two other times, one being yesterday during my day off, and apparently asked where I was. 
I don't know for sure, but I suspect that this guy might be cousins with Hayden as they sort of look alike and have similar mannerisms. Both look super similar to the Parkland guy and have that same creepy vibe. This might not be the scariest thing on here, but I think I'm being stalked by my old co-worker, and I'll update if anything else happens. Update. Tonight I worked the closing shift and was outside getting carts after the store closed at 8pm when two SUVs pulled into the parking lot. One of them parked behind the store and the other one parked in the main parking lot. I was standing in front of the entrance doors when a man dressed in all black and wearing a hood stepped out of one of the SUVs. Another guy walked up next to him and they both started approaching the store. I politely told them that we were closed and then I looked down to notice a large baseball bat in the hoodie guy's hand. I started repeatedly ringing the doorbell to be let back inside and these guys were just pacing back and forth in the lot staring right at me. My manager let me in and called the police. The guys were long gone when they got there. And this could have easily been a totally unrelated incident, but I thought I'd still update because the whole thing makes me think it could have been you-know-who. When I was in junior high school, I was quite an odd kid. I liked having colorful hair, piercings, and all that kind of stuff, and the school I went to was near Atlanta, so there weren't many people like me. I tried to find friends that liked the same kind of music and other interests, and I could normally kind of brush off any weird energy that people put off, ignored it. I just wanted friends. Anyway, I was in a gym one day, hanging out with a group of weirdos, and there was a guy I hadn't seen before. He was wearing a Guns N' Roses t-shirt and jeans that were like a size too small. His name was Ernest. We immediately clicked with each other in a platonic way because we laughed at a lot of the same things. We started hanging out in the gym together every day, people watching and making fun of people playing basketball. It wasn't too long until he started making fun of my appearance and making me feel absolutely terrible about myself. I had super acne bad in high school and... He joked about that I had meth skin. Alright, first strike. Me being me though, I kept hanging out with him and eventually it led to hanging out after school. He would invite me over to his house and we only stayed in his room. He refused to let me meet his family. His parents didn't really speak English but I still wanted to meet them. I always thought it was weird that Ernest didn't know Spanish but his siblings did. And when he could speak words it sounded almost Russian. He pretty much only played It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia on TV and rambled about superheroes and would always come up with these strange scenarios where he was an evil villain and how much power he could have. Fast forward, I get a job at a pizza place. Ernest gets the same job at this pizza place, so inevitably we are always together. Always. He pretty much never lets me out of his grasp. It got to a point where he took me to school every day in his PT Cruiser, which I still get chills every time I see one of those freaking shoe-shaped cars. We started skipping school a lot. I mean, we pretty much went to school about two or three times a week, and this is where it starts to suck pretty bad. He started pressuring me to do intimate things with him. I don't really want to get into detail because it's pretty disturbing, but he manipulated the situation in such a way I felt like we were in a relationship because I thought that I needed him. He really convinced me that we were a couple, but I was so repulsed by him that I never could fully accept that. He started telling our friends that we had slept together and that we were in a relationship, but I denied it all, and to this today I still deny it. I've lied to therapists, I've lied to friends, but right now I am admitting to all of that. At one point he ended up living with me and my family in the same room as me. He had convinced my entire family that he was gay so that he could live with me. He literally dressed up in pink and put a scarf around his neck and pranced around my aunt trying to win her over with this fake personality. I was so used to living in chaos that this was barely a problem for me. During all of this, he was so rude to me. I remember asking for a ride one day, I can't remember to where, and he said no, for no good reason. I started to get really angry because he couldn't actually give me a reason. He just kept smirking at me. 
He did this type of thing frequently. We were sitting in the living room and he suddenly got up and drove off somewhere, came back, walked into the living room doorway, stared at me for 15 seconds and walked into my room. I hear a bunch of rustling, so I storm in there thinking he's up to something sketchy. He's gotten completely dressed in his sleep pants with his hand in his pocket. He just wouldn't take his hand out of his pocket. At this point, I'm scared. I force my hand into his pockets and pull out a knife. I don't remember how the night or days continued after that. Fast forward again. I'm at my best friend Kayla's birthday party and everyone is camping in the backyard. Ernest hated Kayla because she was a way out for me in his perspective. She got in the way of us. I'm sweating typing this out because this is probably one of the scariest things that ever happened to me. The sequence of events is a little bit blurry but I remember it. I had made it clear to Ernest at this point in time that we were not a thing and that he needed to let go of that fantasy. I had a crush on this boy named John and we slept in the same tent together. Morning comes and I hear Ernest outside asking people if they knew where I was. Someone said, she's in the tent with John. I was scared immediately. I knew something bad was about to happen. The tent rips open. I don't have a shirt on. He begins screaming as loud as he can, cussing all of us out and just pitching an absolute fit and he storms off. He goes to his car and calls me and tells me to get to the car now. Everyone there was freaked out and Kayla advised me not to go to the car because she knew how scary Ernest was just as a person. I didn't want anyone to be uncomfortable so I figured that if I went to the car it would ease everyone just a little bit that he wasn't there. I went. As soon as the door closed we sped off. Fast. Really fast. I look over at him wide eyed and he is scream crying with absolutely no expression on his face. Tears streaming but emotionless. He says, you were supposed to love me, over and over and over again. He starts speeding faster and said, if I can't love you, then no one else can. I'm actively having a straight panic attack in the passenger seat. I can't hear because my ears are ringing and I can't see a thing. Meanwhile, Kayla has already called my mom and somehow my mom left the house fast enough to track us down in that PT cruiser. They parks at a church and my mom is watching us. Ernest has a box cutter at his side. I get a call from my mom. I can't really, really remember what she said, but I know it was something along the lines of, I'm going to slit your throat to Ernest. He started coming to his senses, if you can even call it that, and drops me back off at Kayla's and tells me that he's going to end his own life after he drops me off. Kayla and I were frantically trying to call his parents about what was possibly imminent. However, they could not speak English. He called the police on himself because he thought he was going to harm himself or someone else. He was gone for a couple of weeks and when he came back, he parked outside my school waiting for me to come out. He runs up to me. I noticed that he had on a plaid button-up shirt and it was tucked into his pants, which was just extremely odd to me and I knew immediately that this was a fake personality. He was speaking differently as well, proper almost, like a few weeks had turned him into a saint. It wasn't long after that that I had admitted myself into a mental institution because I just kept breaking down. Everyone in the group told me to get rid of him and I had not realized how serious this was until I saw everyone's reactions to the stories. There are so many stories of this psycho, but I can't even type it all out. I did get rid of him. I found new friends, and without him, I don't know how this could have gone. I haven't seen or spoken to him in about three years, and I hope I never do. So this happened within the last 24 hours. I live in a large city in the US. Like many people, I have taken it on myself to try and get back in shape during the new year, so I've recently got into running and lifting five days a week. Yesterday was a run day for me. I usually start at my apartment and cross over to this long park that runs the river close to my apartment. The park is filled with sports fields, tennis courts, and many runners along the pathway. 
I've been going two to three times a week for just over a month. I was on my run last night listening to a podcast, minding my own business, and decided to go a little further than I normally do. To this, this longer stretch where the park sort of ends for like a half a mile before it picks back up. Kind of an area where they park equipment. Many people avoid this area due to it being a waterfront and pretty ugly. I decided to run to the end of this area before circling back home. As I'm running, I see a man 200 or so feet ahead of me walking my direction. Not unusual at all. I passed like 40 people already, but this area is empty except him and I, as most people, circle back. Still, I ride my bike here to commute for work and have never gotten weird vibes. I'm also an average built man and feel pretty secure most places in my relatively safe neighborhood. I keep running, listening to my podcast when I notice the man's path is directly in line with me, as in if I continue 150 more feet I'd run right into him. So I shift to the other side of the path, 10 or so feet, keep running, not paying attention, look back up and he's in my path again, still no alarms. Maybe he shifted to get out of my way and we did that thing where we both went. So I shift back to the side I started on. I watch him. He shifts to my side. I'm thinking this guy is messing with me. I'm 50 feet away and between there and 20 feet I keep shifting more and more quickly. He follows me exactly to the point he is sidestepping instead of moving forward, waiting for me to reach him. At this point, I take his presence in. He is 6'3 at the shortest, in jeans and black hoodie with the hood up. Can't really make out his face due to a street light behind him casting a shadow. I begin to realize I might be in trouble. I come to a stop and pull my headphones out and begin the sentence. What are you doing, man? I get to, what are you doing, when he raises both arms above his head and begins to scream at me. Not legible words I can hear over my podcast. I do notice he has something long and white or beige in his hands. At this point, I begin to backtrack, keeping my eyes on him. All of a sudden, he dashes towards me, running with his arms stretched out to grab me. I turn and hightail it the other way. It should be known I am not in the best of shape. I've had numerous injuries requiring surgeries and... I've just done about 75% of my intended run for the night, but I've never ran faster. He kept pace and closed much of the distance, but when we started going slight uphill, I continued to make ground. We came to a fork in the path after about a minute of this. The two paths circled around a fenced-in area that contained construction vehicles and mowers, etc. I made it look like I was going one way and at the last moment dashed the other way. The paths kind of made a circle so I was able to get far enough ahead of to where he couldn't see me via the fence and bushes, and when I felt like it was my chance, I dove into a bush, clawed my way under the fence and crawled through the space and out the other side of the fence. He kept looking for me in the bushes, prowling back and forth and finally saw me on the other side of the enclosure. At this point, I was already on the phone with the police trying to get help as I gulped down breaths of air. I was also warning other runners. He eventually just followed my pace opposite side of the fence. He kept ducking into darker areas around the enclosure and eventually I lost sight of him. I began getting worried again and kept wandering around, warning people while I waited on the cops. After about 15 minutes of not seeing him, I pieced out of there as the cops said they were close. The jog home was horrible and any time a runner passed me I would have a mini panic attack. I was in shock and running off adrenaline the remainder of the night. I'm not really sure what happened or what was going on, it felt like it was from a movie. Today I checked the Citizen app and Twitter to see if anything had happened, and I'm not sure if it's related, it most likely isn't, but five hours after I called the cops they pulled the body of a man out of the river a mile or two downriver from where the attempted attack occurred. I attended a pretty awful university in the UK. 
In fact, it was so awful that Vice even published an article written by a student that attended at the same time as me titled, Three Years of Hell at the University of Wolverhampton. I lived in a student building in the middle of the city. Of the three student buildings available, it was the middle choice. Literally, it was situated in the middle of the three, and almost figuratively, it was the middle, not as fancy as the fancy one, not as unbearable as the worst one. Most of my friends lived in the fancy building. To get there, I had to walk a small trek through a residential part of the city, but my friends found a shortcut. You could actually cut through and climb up at the back of a garden behind an abandoned house to get there in less than half the time. I started using this shortcut all the time. One morning I walked around towards the garden and down to my shortcut and found three grown men standing there. They all looked, for lack of a better word, thuggish and large. I uttered a small, oh, when I saw them and they all looked up at me. A pale 19 year old gay country boy with a blonde mohawk. I think I apologized for barging in on what I was pretty sure was a drug deal and I turned to walk back the way I came and take the long way around. As I walked away, one of them shouted to get my attention. I ignored them, and then I heard them coming after me, so I started to run. I was much younger, slimmer, and fitter back in those days, so I managed to outrun them pretty easily and sprinted all the way around the long route to my friend's building, where they let me in. I explained what had happened, and no one was surprised. This was Wolverhampton, after all. A few minutes later, a friend of ours arrived. He lived at a non-university student building off campus and had to walk a different way to get to where we were. When he arrived, he asked me, Kyle, what did you do? I asked him why, and he said that an enormous guy had come up to him and asked if he'd seen a guy with a blonde mohawk, but my friend acted dumb even though he immediately knew who he'd been talking about. My poor choice of hair was fairly distinct. The worst part, the guy was carrying a brick in his hand. Still gives me shivers all these years later. But it doesn't end there. My friends and I went for a day out to Birmingham. Bright lights, big city, whatever. And didn't get home until late. We got back to their building and drank until way after midnight. I started to relax and forget my horrible ordeal from earlier that morning. At some point... More than a little drunk, I decided to head home. I was now pretty sure I would never take that shortcut again, so I took the long way home instead. As I was walking through the residential area, a car stopped on the opposite side of the road. There were two guys in the car, and the car was filled with smoke and stank of weed when they rolled down the window to speak to me. I didn't have headphones in or anything, and I was the only person on the street, so I couldn't ignore them or pretend I couldn't hear them. Nice hair, the driver said, and his friend sneered. Oi, mate, do you know we can get some food? I don't know, in the city center? I said. I kept walking, trying not to show them how unnerved I was. They were facing the wrong way to drive alongside me, so the driver put the car in reverse so that they could keep pace with me. Do you know any places? A few. There's a kebab place at the top of the road. Get in and show us, yeah? I'm drunk and tired and I've got lectures in the morning. I said, trying to sound casual even though I was just about ready to pee my pants. It hadn't been a good day. We're going to turn around and come back and pick you up. Wait there, yeah? The driver said. As the car started towards the end of the road, which was a dead end to turn around, I heard the passenger say, it's him. I knew it was him. When the car was far enough away, I broke into a sprint and ran back towards my building. I stumbled down some stairs and twisted my ankle pretty badly, but managed to limp the rest of the way and got through the front door just as the car drove past. I dread to think what could have happened that day. For the rest of my time at that god-awful university, I prayed to never meet any of those guys again, and fortunately never did. Close to ten years ago, my best mate and I scored the deal of the century. 
Liv and her parents recently purchased and refurbished home for cheap as chips rent, so the property wasn't considered unoccupied and their insurance still covers it. They were planning on selling their house in the country and moving close to the town in the year, but when they spotted this place, it was perfect, so they snapped it up. They couldn't be bothered dealing with rando tenants for a year, so we were offered it. Schwing. It was a lovely old mid-Victorian style house with a hallway running the majority of the length on the left side and three bedrooms and a bathroom coming off that hallway to the right. At the back of the house was an open plan living room and kitchen and a backyard. It was in an inner Melbinian suburb so it was totally fenced in with a six foot fence on three sides and the front had a cutesy white picket fence. On the right side of the property, an outdoor gravel pathway was wedged beside the bedroom walls and the fence line. It began with a gate in the front yard and ran the length of the property to the backyard. This is important later. My mate obviously scored the master bedroom at the front with lovely vertically opening bay windows facing the front garden and street. I had the next bedroom with a window facing the gravel path and fence, and the third bedroom was our study. We lived here for close to ten months in bliss. Great house, great company, and even though the area was considered a little dicey, the location was Stella. One hot summer's night we said our goodnights, and I hit the hay and zonked out immediately. My housemate stayed up in bed and read for a bit with just her bedside light on. She was doing that for just over an hour before she heard a weird scritch scratch on the front window of her bedroom. Initially, she put it down to an overhanging tree branch till she realized there was no overhanging tree branch. She sat frozen in fear, blankly staring at her book for what felt like eternity, till she heard the noise again and again. Scritch, scratch, scritch, scratch. Slowly looking up, she saw a dude wearing a hoodie trying to open her window, looking her dead in the eyes. She screamed, jumped out of bed, and ran straight into my room. I woke up super dazed as she was pulling my hand and whisper yelling, you know the one, that someone was trying to break in. She had a tendency to be a little over dramatic sometimes, but I swear I've never seen someone look so genuinely terrified. I went to grab my phone to call the cops, but we just went completely still when we heard the distinct crunch, crunch, crunch of someone walking down the side path of the house. We both rolled off of my bed onto the floor and went completely still. The crunches continued, getting closer to the bedroom window. I don't know what it was about, distinct sounds at night when it's otherwise quiet, but it sounded deafening. And then I realized why it was so loud. My window was wide open. I jumped up, slid the window down, and slammed the lock shut just as he reached the window. He looked at me, but he didn't react at all. He just calmly tried to open the window, but when he realized he couldn't, he continued down the path to the backyard. I was thoroughly soiling myself now, and my housemate was sobbing on the floor looking up at me like a bunny about to be torn apart by a fox. I sprinted to the back door to thankfully find it locked and ran back to my room and called the cops. I don't know what the cops knew that we didn't, but they must have broken a land speed record to arrive in all of three minutes later, lights and sirens off. I saw them go down the side path, guns drawn, straight to the backyard. There were some noises from the front, then a knock at the back door a moment later and the police identified themselves. Turns out the dude had vaulted the back fence, an impressive feat if you ask me, and another patrol car was headed to the next street over to look for him. The two cops at our place asked if we were okay, then asked if they could come in and look around. The cops were honestly amazing. They managed to calm us down whilst making sure the place was safe, and I was really impressed with how they handled the situation. I offered them a cup of coffee, which they politely declined, as they took our statements, and they asked if there was anyone that we could stay the night with. My housemate and I stayed at our boyfriend's place for a few nights after that, and when we stayed in the house, it was never the same. We felt completely violated and ended up moving out a few weeks later. We never found out if the dude was caught, 
but there was a random stabbing a few nights after the incident at the train station two streets over. If it was related or not, I don't know. But all I can think is that we were so lucky that it went the way it did. My wife and I traveled back to our hometown in Brisbane, Australia for the New Year holidays to spend time relaxing in the sun with the extended family and friends. Unfortunately, it was ruined by an encounter with a creep who insisted, with a very vicious persistence, that I wear the party hat that came out of the bonbon I shared with him. For those who don't know, a bonbon is like a party cracker that two people pull from each end and break open. They contain a small trinket like a whistle, balloon, party hat, etc. I knew hardly anyone at the party except for my wife's immediate family, which totaled four people. There were about 20 people gathered. After dinner dessert was served, and along with it some festively decorated bonbons, I was seated next to a man of about 30. He looked relatively normal except he hadn't touched a drop of alcohol the whole night and as far as I could tell, he was nursing the same ginger beer I saw him with when I first walked in. Apart from exchanging a friendly nod when I sat next to him, we hadn't said a word to each other. Then the bonbons came out and I suddenly found myself being presented with one end of it by him. Other guests were already pulling theirs apart, so I obliged and pulled my end. A small folded square of paper flew out and into my lap. It was a party hat purple, shaped like a crown, and made from what looked like tissue paper. I laughed and offered it to him. He stared pointedly at me, really cold, hard eyes. Put it on, mate, he said. It sounded more like an order. I instantly felt awkward and didn't know whether to laugh at his reaction or not. I excused myself and told him I'd give it to one of the kids as it was clearly far too small to fit on my head. He didn't like this answer. Come on, it's a party. Just have some fun and put the hat on. He was visibly angry when he said it. My awkwardness peaked to an intolerable level and I told him I'd go find one of the kids to give it to. I found my wife and asked who the guy was. She said she didn't know him but knew his name was Jono and took the hat from me. I saw he wasn't seated at the table anymore but was mingling about the room talking to other guests. But as he was talking to them, he would look over at me and even point me out and say something to the person. They looked confused and a little creeped out themselves, by the way. He was making a gesture like putting a hat on too. Then he would screw up his face when looking at me. A little later, I was having small talk with my wife's brother-in-law when... Jono came out of nowhere and said to him, You see that guy here? He looked disgusted at me. He wouldn't even put the freaking hat on. It's New Year's Eve and he won't even have any fun. Her brother-in-law looked really confused and sort of just steered the conversation back to ourselves while trying to ignore him. As Jono left our chat, he said to me, coming in real close to my ear, You'll wear that hat even if I have to put it on your dead head myself. Well, when someone says something like that, you know what you do. The rest of the evening was spent in nervous anticipation of another run-in with Jono. He was still there, of course, watching me from one side of the room or the other, sometimes had a grin, and would make a gun with his finger and go bang, bang, bang silently across the room. I did, however, come face to face with him again that night as I went to the toilet. It was occupied and I stood waiting by the door. I heard the toilet flush, then the door opened. It was Jono. He looked me up and down, then put his arm across the door frame. Sorry, only for people who wear party hats. He looked defiant, psychotic, and very dangerous. Then he laughed and removed his arm. A few moments after I had entered the toilet, there was a massive bashing sound on the door. The door shook on its hinges. Once, twice, then one final time, which knocked the door handle off completely. Then Jono screaming at me from outside in the hall. Where the hat? 
It's a party. Wear it. And then there was a weird silence. The only sound was the muffled music coming from the living room. Everyone was silent. It stayed like that for a few minutes, maybe more, then I exited. Everyone seemed to be acting normally, and what's more, there was no Jana to be found. One guest, I didn't know their name, asked me if I heard the guy banging his head against the door, and I wasn't going to stick around to see if he was still there. I grabbed my wife and made an excuse to leave, and we got out of there, but it didn't end. The next day, Around 3 a.m. it was, there were three or four sharp knocks on my front door. They definitely weren't from somebody's hand. It sounded more like a hammer or something heavy. I opened the door very slowly and found no one there. And that's when I noticed it. Nailed to my front door with a ten-penny nail through it was the purple hat I had pulled from the bonbon. We cut our holiday short and flew home the next day. It was November 2017. This was a time in my life when I severely struggled with alcoholism and drug addiction, as many in the town I live do, so please judge my decisions knowing that. Me and my friend were skint most of the time, but used to frequent a pub. Now this particular pub had a bad reputation, but had recently been taken over by a new landlord who had began to turn it around. They had an okay crowd, the usual for the type of working area. The Imperial. On this particular evening, I had come into about 50 pounds in cash, so I called my mate and before long, we were hitting the town. We started in this particular pub we will call the Imperial. I rocked up to the bar and ordered two drinks for me and my friend. As I did, I noticed a very scruffy looking woman dressed in disheveled clothing. Naturally, I ignored it and sat down. About an hour went by before my pal noticed the scruffy looking middle aged woman was lurking about three meters behind us, just staring. This gave us the fear, and we decided to go out and smoke a cigarette. We headed outside, donned our hats and coats, and smoked two cigarettes each before returning to see the woman sat at our table. This wasn't a problem for us. We could just get another table, but as we walked over, she stood up and returned to her original position, so we took her old table back. Upon sitting down, I see the woman begin to approach the table. She stands behind him and starts touching his shoulder. He turns around and asks, What are you doing? She swiftly replies in a very high-pitched voice, can I sit here, please? This was when I realized that my friend had completely misheard the question. He believed she said, Can I have a ciggy? So he replied, mm, Yeah, sure. She dropped herself down in the seat next to her. It was really awkward in this new form threesome. What made it particularly worse is that she just maintained the same overbearing smile, not moving at all. It was with all of this that I had presumed she may be mentally challenged, perhaps. My cousins have similar issues, so I decided to be nice and involve her for a little while. After all, she seemed harmless. And this was a mistake. After trying to involve her in the conversation with no luck, I signaled for a friend to go for a cigarette. She stayed at the table. Outside, me and my friend talked about how awkward it was and how we wanted to leave and decided to leave the back way without her seeing us. It was at this moment I realized I had left my phone on the table with her. I walked over to the table, and as she saw me coming, she snatched my phone up. Playing dumb, I said, Hey, thanks for your company tonight, but I gotta go. You haven't seen my phone, have you? After saying this, her face changed, and the mood took a dark turn. I could feel something was brewing, although her face was still ecstatically smiling. Why are you leaving? There's no reason to. She said while making the creepiest eye contact I've ever seen in my whole life. You can have it for a kiss. She said as she held my phone up. I thought fast and snatched it out of her hand before storming off fast out the door and meeting my friend outside. I was shook and told him to walk fast. Road to the Brunswick. 
The road outside the Imperial is long and straight, and you can basically see from one end to the other. We were walking fast for a while before slowing down and then stopping to light a cigarette. Whilst we were stopped, we noticed the silhouette of what appeared to be this woman coming towards us at some pace. Frightened, we turned a corner and took the back streets and alleys, turning at every opportunity we could. There was no chance she could have followed us, and we even waited to see if she was coming. After ten minutes, we started walking to a smaller pub called the Brunswick. We walked and talked about the strangeness of her, but really forgot about it pretty fast. The Brunswick. Upon arriving there, we scanned the room for her just in case and headed to the bar area, got more drinks and stayed at the bar. An hour passed and we were both quite drunk, so we decided to leave. This, and I cannot stress enough, was a huge mistake. We walked outside and around the corner when, perhaps by coincidence, we bumped into her again. She began screaming things about how I should love her, and how she had done so much for me. Completely taken by surprise and shock, I watched her run towards me. My friend ran back and watched in horror as she grabbed me and began licking and spitting on my face while she bear hugged me. I managed to slip out of her grips and sprinted off onto the main road. Needless to say, I got very drunk that night to make up for it. So I live in the Phoenix metro area. I had just gotten off of work at 9.30pm. I work at a marketing job that requires me to stay semi-late. However, they've been letting me out a little early so I could catch the bus home and save money from taking an Uber. Due to my financial situation, I'm unable to drive my car since it's broken down. I've been having to ride the bus this past month. Now anyways, there's two buses I have to take to get home. One going down the road a few miles from where I work. The second one that takes me a few miles, stopping a couple of blocks away from my apartment. I board the first bus at around 10.10pm 10 and ride with no incident. I exited the first bus and needed to cross a busy street to get to the next bus stop. I noticed my second bus was already at the stop, however I couldn't cross the street because the cars had a green light and I couldn't cross yet, and since there were so many cars, I couldn't just book it across the street. By the time the crosswalk signaled me to go, the bus had already gone. Next one wasn't coming for another half hour. I'm kind of frustrated, so I just crossed the street, sat down on the bench at the stop, and watched videos with my earbuds in. It was 10.20pm at this point. The next bus doesn't arrive until 10.50pm. It's important to note that I'm a 19-year-old girl, so I'm already anxious about being out late at night in the cold. I look up and notice four men walking in my direction. I try to look down at my phone and pay no mind. One sat from the bench across from me, another guy sat next to me, the other two men were standing. The man across from me had a blue jacket and hat. He tells me I'm beautiful, asking for personal info, normal banter from guys. I just politely smile and continue looking at my phone. This guy didn't seem to be happy about it and started calling me all sorts of names, like ugly crack expletive, etc. I couldn't help but laugh since this guy was getting butthurt because I had rejected his advances. At this point, his friends were standing up in my defense, saying he shouldn't talk to a woman that way. I did nothing to provoke him, etc. Blue Jacket guy starts getting more hostile in his tone and my instincts tell me to quietly pull out my pepper spray just in case things escalated. Good thing I did because now Blue Jacket guy gets up and starts pacing around getting too close for comfort. So his friends stand around forming a shield against me. It felt like an eternity before the bus finally showed up. I told the men to board first and said I need to speak to the driver first. All of them board and I tell the driver not to let the blue jacket guy ride the bus. I explain the situation. Even his friends and other passengers on the bus told the driver not to let him on board. The driver then asked what street the blue jacket guy was getting off at. He said Sunset Drive, and then the driver asked me which street I was getting off on. Not wanting to alert the guy where I was getting off, I didn't name the street but did said I was getting off way past Sunset Drive. The driver then got back to his seat and started driving. Blue Jacket guy tried to sit next to me but one of his friends sat down next to me first while the other two sat across from me. Blue Jacket guy sat as close to me as he could, 
five seats down. His friends said that they would protect me, beat him up if he escalates things. There were some exchanges back and forth between these guys, and Blue Jacket guy was too worried to listen. By the time we made it to Sunset Drive, his friends exited the bus, but the Blue Jacket guy stayed on. I told the driver he was supposed to get off here, but was now refusing. His friends were begging him to get off the bus, but he kept refusing. He kept trying to convince the driver that he said the wrong street name, but the driver wasn't buying it. Blue Jacket guy starts walking towards me. I had my pepper spray clutched in my hand, preparing for the worst. I'm now on my phone with my boyfriend, crying and telling him to meet at me at my stop. Driver guy gets up and tells Blue Jacket guy he needs to exit the bus or else the local police would be called. At this point, Blue Jacket guy finally gives up and exits the bus. As the bus was pulling away, Blue Jacket guy hits my window, yelling obscenities at me. I did eventually meet my boyfriend at the stop and he safely walked me home. And now I'm sitting on the couch, typing this out, and self-medicating with a wax pen. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r Let's Read Official, and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, there's always something lurking in the dark. <laughs>